it's peculiar that once again, a tool that was developed maybe with the best intentions to catch the bad guys, it's the journalists that end up on the hit list. Last year, the world was shocked by the discovery of the Pegasus spyware, a piece of software that infiltrated smartphones of journalists, human rights defenders, active activists, and politicians, through which the data of their microphones, cameras, messages, and all other data on their phones was leaked to governments and secret services, a threat to freedom of speech, freedom of press, and a threat to our democracy. Can journalists still do their work freely if they know that they're being followed? And how are on and offline safety connected? What does that mean for press freedom? And do journalists self-censor? Again, a warm welcome to the Bali and a warm welcome to uh, Persvrijheid of Selfcensure. have is list of phone numbers that were targeted and you are among them. And what does that program do? It's transmitting your messages, your images, just everything that's happened on your phone. Shit. Your phone was compromised. They send an attack, steal a bunch of data. The moment they do it, the phone is compromised. They can exfiltrate whatever they want. It's just pretty much automatic. We have access to a lot of information about a massive surveillance campaign all over the world that's exclusive materials. It's about who is spying on who in many countries. Journalist Jamal Khashoggi was killed inside their consulate in Istanbul. His close friends were surveilled after the murder. Es la constatación de un espionaje planetario, de un gran crimen mundial. Es una bomba, es una bomba atómica. Niečo zlé je pod povrchom, niečo zlé je v samých základoch nášho štátu. We knew that the country is corrupted. The judges, the police, Supreme Court, Constitutional Court, all these positions were completely in the hands of this mafia type of system that these oligarchs created. And the murder of Jan Kuciak and Martina Kushnirova was the breaking point when we realized, okay, now they are ready even to kill. I believe 100% Marian Kuciak ordered the murder of Jan Kuciak. Jan Kuciak wrote extensively about uh, his economic criminal activity. Lebo veľmi píšeš o veľmi zlých ľudí a ja sa veľmi bojím o teba. Ale môžete si byť istí, že začnem sa vám, vám osobne, začnem pán Kuciak špeciálne venovať. A to je vám, vražka? No lebo vám, vám to hovorím, pokojne vám to hovorím, začnem sa venovať špeciálne vám, vašej osobe, vašej matke, vašmu osobe a vašej súrode. Ako náhle And then I received a copy of the police investigation file, including the cell phones and computers of Marian Kochner. Here are the devices from the shooter, uh, the driver, 
the middlemen. We have SIM cards, tablets, computers. Tens of thousands of messages. The judge is asking Kochner how he should rule. <laughs> That's how it works. We could prove the police is corrupted, the judges are corrupted. It was all there. This data could totally shake Slovakia. Very um, moving story. Um, so, just a quick recap: Your um, a colleague of yours and a friend, I think, Jan Kuczak, was killed, and uh, his partner. Um, what were they um, investigating? It's already a bit in the video, but just. Uh, um, Martina was not a journalist, even though she was the first one who was reading Jano's stories. But when Jano was murdered, uh, he was. We were working on a story that was connecting then Prime Minister of Slovakia with the most powerful Italian, ma Italian Mafia, Andrangheta. It's from Calabria. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I went to police protection program. and um, But only later it showed up. Uh, Jano was not killed by Italian Mafia, but by Slovak businessmen. Yeah. And... Um even after his murder, you um, you continue to the investigation, um, and in the end, uh, the government of Slovakia fell because of this case, right? Um, how hard was this to uncover, and, and what were the risks involved uh, when you were doing this story? Um, you know, it started differently. At the beginning, I just wanted to know and understand what happened, why Jano was killed, how, who ordered it. Like really the basic information is the case of, of Sabi who will also needs to know what and why. And we didn't trust the police that they will independently investigate the murder. So we decided we are going to investigate the murder and we went to uh, Velka Macha, what is the, the place where Jana was living and, and where he was killed and and we conducted hours of interviews and, and gathered CCTV footage and uh, but we didn't get you know far. Uh, we talked to the parents so we got access to some of the information and after about a year we were able to reconstruct how Jano and Martina were killed. And it was probably the most difficult story I wrote in my life because it was um, really when when you when you listen again and again how your friend and, and close colleague was murdered, uh, shot and and you know what it did to his body and and so on. It's it's not um, easy work. And uh, you know the next year I received the police investigation file, including all the annexes, and, and then it really started to be interesting. And we understood that, you know, it was originally unsorted, it was 70 terabytes of data, what is a lot. Panama Papers, it's, it was four and a half terabytes of data, so much, much more. And it took uh, OCCRP tech team two months only to sort out the data to make it accessible to journalists, so we don't need to, you know, type in a query yeah. in a command line to get to the information, but really what, what you saw there, just, you know, to click on, on the file and understand what's in there. And uh, and then I talked to my, my friend and colleague, Slovak journalist and, and writer these days, Arpad uh, Scholtes, and, and we talked a lot about it, and we decided that we are just going to be coordinators of the team composed of different media from Slovakia, of mm -hmm. a journalist we trust, and we decided that we need all the media possible that are unbiased to work on those stories because it's it's too big yeah. just for us. So we created this team, and there were people from you know TVs, there were people from dailies, weeklies, but for from tabloids as well. Yeah, uh, and they provided excellent paparazzis that we needed in in one story so it really worked well and and we were actually able to to finish all the stories Siano started but was never able to finish because we all 
felt motivated and we all felt that, you know, if we would just, you know, shut down any investigative, journalistic investigative activities, then the guy who ordered the murder would win, yeah. you know, because it would be a strong message. You know, you can just kill the story by killing a journalist and that's it, you know. So we needed to, to send out another message and that was, if you are going to kill a journalist, 20 other journalists would pick up the stories and they will be highly motivated to do whatever possible to finish the stories. And, and did you, you and your colleagues at that time received any threats? Yeah, sure. A lot. <laughs> did you feel unsafe at, at that time? That's um, actually a benefit of foreign journalists. I'm not living in Slovakia, so unlike my other journal, um, my other colleagues, I was able to, to go home and close the doors and feel safe. Yeah. Um, but yes, they were threatened, we were all threatened, and uh, it was also one of the reasons it was me who received the copy of the data because it was clear clear that if uh, the former parties that lost uh, and took down the system would regain the power, they would go after each journalist who touched the data. Yeah. So the source decided that the that copy of the data must be somewhere else, out of Slovakia. Yeah. And and um, is this 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 uh, prime minister um, still a politician? Is he running again for? Uh... He's member of a parliament. Uh, he is a deputy. Is leader of recently most powerful political party, and probably in a year they will be back at power. So then the journalists are under fire. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, Tom, um, is this something you 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 recognize uh, throughout Europe? Is this a, a trend that uh, journalists are being threatened? And uh, do you see that at Free, free Press Unlimited? Well, unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, we see. I mean, we have Hungary, of course, where it's very easy to pick at because Mr. Orban is a very easy pickings on that. But we also see countries like Slovakia. We see Poland. I mean, where decisions are being made. Uh, but I also would like to say we can see it even in the Netherlands. Uh, we see it in the Netherlands where uh, the press is no longer free to collect the stories that they want to collect. Um, luckily, we have some support mechanisms in countries like the Netherlands. Uh, we have the project called Pers Veilig, uh, which is assisting journalists in doing their work. And they're working together with the police. But in a lot of the countries that we talk about, I mean, going to the police might actually heighten the risk that you're running. Yeah. So, yes. Regarding digital threats, what are the latest trends and what worries you the most at the time? Uh, what worries most my, myself the most is people who say I have nothing to hide. Or the people that say they know everything already. So basically the fatalism, not taking steps. What we do see because of programs like Pegasus, and other uh, measures is that they do not know everything. Otherwise, they would not have the need to deploy such tactics. So, yes, I'm going to be the eternal optimist. And yes, I do believe that we can take steps to mitigate certain risks. Um, will that probably affect the work-life balance? Unfortunately, yes. So we might have to reconsider how we do certain things. Um, for instance, if we know that phones are so susceptible to being hacked, should we still have a phone? What can you do without a phone? I think that is a question that the journalists have to ask when they start the project. Are we going to use our mobile devices during the course of this project? And dumb and phones? And sometimes it might be necessary to meet at a park bench or to have the tap brother running. Yeah. yeah. And, and how about using dumb phones? Unfortunately, those dumb phones only look dumb. They're so high-tech these days even. Even the simple Nokia is basically running something called KaiOS, which is the operating system, which is basically a slimmed-down version of Android. So the base layer is still the same. It might look dumb, but it's everything but. Yeah, so still something like Pegasus could enter um, that phone. I cannot comment on that because I don't know any uh, KaiOS-infected devices. But I do believe that we, as users of the technology have our own responsibility as well. 
we need to be aware of the risks that we are running. Uh, yes, companies need to take steps as well. Um, and as companies like Meta are obviously showing that they are doing everything they can to protect the user, uh, I think it's still up to the individual to indeed take steps to protect themselves. And by the way, that was a cynical remark about Meta. Savils, do you ever feel that uh, the price you have to pay personally for your journalism is too high? No. It's worth it? Yes, and uh, and and actually, like my surveillance, I mean, it, it's like a minor, I don't know how to phrase it, like, uh, it's, it's a minor thing compared to what happened to, to those people in Mexico, for example, or, or, or even what happened to, to, to Jan Kuciak. I mean, he was like, like physically surveilled before the murder. When the, when the By hit, people from Secret Service. Yes, yeah. So, so I mean, every every murder is is usually the consequence of uh, of some kind of surveillance. Uh, I, for example, when when Yano was uh, was killed, I was uh, I was in the U.S. studying, and and I was really shocked. And uh, one of the one of the main takeaways for me was that like, who am I to be afraid to to continue doing my my work when you know there are so brave journalists that even pay uh, the ultimate price uh, for doing their their job. So in in a way, I think uh, uh, Yano's um, murder did give a huge motivation boost, not just to to Slovak journalists or Czech journalists, but also to. Uh, to the whole journalistic community, and and I think with the, with the, with the Pegasus case, it's at least for me it was the same. I mean, I, I was part of the project. I was also part of the victim pool, but but knowing that there were journalists in Mexico, there was a journalist in 2017 in Mexico who was surveilled with Pegasus. Then he was gunned down uh, at some car wash a couple of weeks later. Uh, so th these things do make me very angry, and these things uh, help me keep going. Yeah, but the the, the theme of th this year's uh, Freidenkers Festival is against the power, and and how important is the role of of journalists in in going against the power? <laughs> essential, absolutely essential. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm. Um you know, I'm a journalist, so so probably ask someone else this question, okay? Tom. <laughs> okay I'm, I'm not a journalist, but uh, for me, journalism is the fourth estate. It is basically the pillar of society that will question democracy. And we need to be able to ask questions. Uh, because when you can't ask questions, the answers will never come. And then people will go on YouTube and Twitter for their news. That's happening right now. Exactly. So we need independent journalists. And, that and can do their work in freedom and freedom of fear. Yeah, and and going to YouTube or Twitter for your news, do you regard that as a digital threat? Misinformation, disinformation is certainly a threat, and it's actively being exploited. Uh, for instance, in the US, if you listen to what Mr. Trump has to say, what he thinks that should happen to journalists that disclose things, um, he wants to put them in jail and have them sexually assaulted, in case you didn't hear that story this week. Uh, but if you have a presidential candidate who's openly saying that, I mean, that sends a chilling effect. And uh, these two people here sitting at the table are brave. I mean, they're incredibly brave. But at the same time, we need to create a safe working environment for those people and for the future generation of journalists, because self-censorship is killing. Did you ever self-censor? No. <laughs> or do you know colleagues who do? Yes. But um, not because of the fear, but because of the money. You know, those who still work in the media of uh, our former prime minister, uh, they became the tool of his... Uh, vision of the world and they just don't see it as a problem to self-center yeah they they just you know want to make the owner happy so they you know pick up the the topics that would please andre babish and uh, they frame the stories the way that it would please andre babish so 
that self-censorship or maybe s self-cynicism. <laughs> Um, I would like to ask one question to uh, an honorable guest here in the audience, Thijs Reuten, who is uh, part of the European Parliament and is also working uh, on this uh, Pegasus Committee. Um, Thijs, how do you see the role of the European Union in, in safeguarding uh, the freedom of press? And yeah, the, just the, the mic is coming uh, to, towards you. Well, I think uh, press freedom is, is for, two, for two reasons uh, a cornerstone of democracy. Because when something is wrong with democracy or with the rule of law, it mostly has started with some kind of curbing of press freedom. So it's an early warning signal for problems with the rule of law and democracy. We have seen that in many EU member states, unfortunately, but also outside the EU, of course. And secondly, uh, when there is some uh, autocrat or, uh, or other governments that, that, that have fear for the questions of journalists, the first thing they are starting to do to get control is to curb uh, journalism and the freedom of press. So on two sides, I think it's a cornerstone of, of democracy and, uh, and, the, and the values that we as European Union cherish so much. I'm indeed a member of the inquiry committee to, uh, to and we go to uh, Cyprus and Greece uh, next week. Um, and um, and we will hopefully uh, uh, get to uh, get some more facts on the table of the still developing case in Greece, for example, which is like changing and getting more revelations by the day. So um, that's what we're trying to work on, and we will keep on fighting for this, uh, regardless the member states that uh, will indeed need to come to uh, together if we want to change things. But we will certainly come up with a report with some uh, tough recommendations. And um, also here in the Netherlands, and uh, we see attacks on, on, on journalists and, and on, on democracy. What, what is there? What should politics do? What, what can? What, what? How can we stop this uh, negative trend from in, evolving even further? And maybe well, a question for for everyone. But please go first. I'm very happy with with organizations like uh, uh, Press uh, Press Freedom Unlimited and 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 other NGOs that are tirelessly working not only inside the EU but also outside the EU and in the Netherlands. We have to uh, preserve and be careful with our democracy because I think, and that is an ironic benefit of what we are experiencing now in uh, the last. Uh, nine months uh, uh, with the war in Ukraine, that we hopefully lose the naivety that things that happened in Hungary, that happened in Slovenia, that are happening in Greece, uh, the spying on a colleague of mine in the European Parliament who is the opposition leader in, in Greece, that, that these things can also happen in other member states, maybe are already happening in other member states. And I think that if we realize that we should not be naive about that, that is the beginning of the defense that we need to do collectively. We need to defend the, 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 the vulnerable uh, democracy and the rule of law that we, we have and that we cherish so much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, but I do believe that there's a task for Brussels as well. If I look at what the European Commission, for instance, is asking about end-to-end -end encryption, where they want to weaken the encryption schemes being used, and they try to get various excuses why, now they've found an excuse, we need to protect our children, that seems to be working, because as soon as you object to it, they put you in a certain role. Um, I think it's also up to the politicians to take a stand there and go like, tools like Pegasus have no place in our society. I mean, th this is not even a dual use tool. This is a single attack tool. Uh, and it's peculiar that once again, a tool that was developed maybe with the best intentions to catch the bad guys, it's the journalists that end up on the hit list. So this is also something where I think that the European can make a stronger stand. The fact that even the President of the United States disagreed with buying the NSO group that is saying something. If even he thinks that buying the NSO group and making it American is a bridge too far, why do we still allow organizations or entities like NSO group to operate? Just a question. 
Actually, I, I want to say something yeah. because uh, uh, re regarding that and, and the Netherlands, I mean, um, I, d I don't want to say out names, but there are certain Dutch politicians who are in very good relationship with uh, our prime minister and his, uh, <laughs> his, his, his circles. And, and I think that, you know, maybe their attitude towards uh, press freedom is pretty similar. And if they ever come to power, probably they will try to copy what's been going on in, in Hungary. I th and I think that one main takeaway of the whole Pegasus case is that, yeah, Hungary is this exotic, far away Eastern European country with a strange leader, uh, and and a lot of people in Western Europe think that you know this is this is none of our concern. This is not our country. This is like you know some troubled uncle or some far away distant relative that's doing crazy things. But in the end, if you if you let these people uh, continue what they're doing they're going to spoil the rest of the of the family and uh, the playbook that was uh, invented in Hungary is already being copied in Poland and in other countries so it can have very serious consequences if if there are no consequences to for example serving journalists in an EU member state